Good evening and uh, welcome to this week's edition of Behind Headlines and in this programme we shall be discussing could the most shocking terrorist attack in Israel's history carried out by Hamas on Saturday the 7th of October be the trigger not only for a regional war but also possibly World War III. Uh, Reagan, it's uh, great to be joining you on this programme uh, looking for different aspects of strategically uh, where Israel's war with Hamas could take the West and uh, the dangers that what we're seeing now is, is essentially um, the start of, of a regional war. Well, it's a very important and critical topic that is on our plate this evening, Simon, as there have been many concerns, many worries around the world, I'm sure, uh, many thoughts concerning where this is going to go. Indeed, it already does seem to be headed toward some form of global conflict. Indeed, we have many of our Western nations expressing support, rightly so, for Israel, sending troops um, to the nearby vicinity. We have warships that have gone into the Mediterranean as well in uh, preparation for potential escalation of conflict. There's been strikes on Aleppo, on the airport there to destabilize the uh, ability to ship certain goods and um, supplies to both Hezbollah and uh, Hamas, but also we've seen retaliatory strikes on U.S. bases across the Middle East with many um, U.S. soldiers now are reportedly suffering from um, various forms of brain trauma as a result of those strikes. So it does seem, Simon, as though we are just one um, minute away from uh, global escalation to a World War III scenario. Which is, a, which is a kind of a frightening scenario, but also a very dangerous scenario. But we also know that strategically um, Israel uh, was up against the wall during Israel's War of Independence right. in 48, turned that around. Uh, we saw that Israel was uh, surrounded by uh, hostile nations wanting to destroy Israel on the eve of the 1967 Six Day War. And, uh, and we saw that Israel turned that around and tripled her size in territory. Again, at the start of the Yom Kippur War over 50 years ago, Israel was attacked by surprise, attacked by the Egyptians and also the Assyrians managed to turn that war around and we could see the same situation again but what is interesting is that evidence has come to light now saying how the Iranian regime were directly involved in the planning of the massacre that took place on the 7th of October uh, and uh, they are stoking the fires of the Middle East that could engulf the entire region. Uh, we see that IDF so far has already launched a limited military operation in Gaza and uh, the Israeli public are demanding that Israel destroys Hamas. At the same time, uh, Hezbollah has launched over 10 rockets into northern Israel, risking a major military confrontation with Israel. And uh, there are concerns now that uh, President Assad to get, uh, would get involved in this conflict, which means that Russia would come to his end and drag possibly both the US and Britain into this conflict. Yeah, you know, this is a poker game where the stakes are extremely high and very deadly. Uh, in, as has already been said, the Americans have deployed, uh, the U.S. has deployed state-of-the-art aircraft carriers to Israel in the northern coastal port of Haifa, and long-range U.S. bombers have already landed in Israel uh, with the hope that this will prevent Iran uh, from escalating the conflict that would lead the entire world into war. I've drawn up a, a little map of uh, the links, some of the obvious and immediate links between um, these various nations that we've already mentioned and it, it does remind me, it has reminded me for a few weeks of what we see in the, the um, prelude essentially to World War I where a range of countries, some of which not particularly connected to the immediate conflict, become embroiled in the conflict because of alliances, allegiances and um, personal a national interest as attached to nations more immediately, um, uh, more immediately related to the situation, and it, it will only take one moment of escalation, uh, probably from Iran 
uh, or potentially uh, a retaliation by Iran against some form of a preemptive action or, or directly targeting Iran by Israel or the U.S. to send everything um, into that World War III scenario that we've been talking about. But uh, for, for now, the U.S. is saying very, very clearly to Iran, don't get involved, don't go there, you don't want to do this because we will get involved if we need to. Um, there's a, a very helpful article in the Sunday Times by Ben Judah. Uh, he writes, right now the secure lines in the Middle East between the royal palaces, the defense ministries, and the U.S. embassies are ringing frantically as Israel's ground incursions in Gaza escalate. Generals, prime ministers, and princes are taking late night calls with President Biden and being pulled aside from meetings. Confusion mixes with fear, not only in Tel Aviv, but in Beirut, Cairo, Amman, Riyadh, and far away Washington, D.C., there is dread that what began with a massacre by Hamas in southern Israel could be a regional war. What if we are back in the summer of 1914? when an incident that could have been contained ended up detonating alliances. And this scenario is not the most probable, but it is very possible. Uh, the Arab-Israeli War of 1973, well, since then, America has built the strong alliance in the, the Middle East, um, real structure there through ties with Israel. There's support for Egypt and Jordan and pledges to the oil-rich monarchies as well in the Gulf. And indeed, we've seen even recently, we've had um, programs in the past three years on the Abraham Accords and some of those growing alliances and treaties being made. But now the U.S. finds itself up against another alliance, which is in the so-called axis of resistance led by Tehran, al allied with the Assad regime in Syria, which is, as we've already said, allied with Russia. I mean, really, um, effectively what we're seeing really is the, uh, the knock-on impact of the war in Iraq in uh, 2003, which was uh, 20 years ago, and we're still seeing, feeling the repercussions of that war now. Essentially what's happened is that the Iranian regime has been able to manipulate the circumstances in the Middle East, turn Iraq into a terror state, and effectively create what's always wanted to create in the Middle East, and that's the Shia presence. We're seeing Iran dominate um, Iran, Syria, Lebanon, Yemen, um, and of course also Hamas in Gaza and huge elements within the Palestinian Authority as well, plus also endangering the likes of, of Jordan as well. So we're seeing that uh, the Iranian Shia crescent uh, is heavily influenced over the Middle East and the pushback on the Iranian regime was always um, uh, President Saddam Hussein's regime. Um, with that, with him being in power and with the Sunnis being in power in Iraq, that acted as a barrier against the regime. But obviously now with the, uh, with the collapse of that uh, regime, and rightly so, as an evil regime, but mm. we didn't actually deal with the head of the snake, which is Iran. So everything really leads back to the Iranian regime. Um, I mean, Ben Yehuda, uh, it's an excellent article if you get a chance to read it in the Sunday Times, a superb analysis. But he does go on to say that it's been built up on a front of missiles uh, tipped proxies which controls chunks of Lebanon, Yemen, Rome firmly in Iraq and with Hamas rule in Gaza. He says a 1914 moment could be at hand. It would look like this. Israel proceeding with a full scale invasion of Gaza sees Iran escalate in turn through its proxies in, Hezb in Hezbollah in southern Lebanon, but also militias in Iraq and the Houthis in Yemen. The Saudis don't believe that Iran wants a full-scale war between Hezbollah and Israel, but as things ramp up, it might lose control and trigger a full-scale response. But we also got a situation in, in Syria, for example, the Iranian regime, has 90,000 Iranian Revolutionary Guards, uh, plus uh, other militias under its control, literally probably only 50 miles away from Israel's border and the Golan Heights. So that could be open up another front. And the fact that Israel has to deal with over 160 to 200,000 Iranian rockets and missiles supplied by its Islamic terror group Hezbollah 
pose an immediate threat to Israel's national security. Depending on how many rockets would be fired at um, any given time, uh, certainly the Iron Dome missile system, uh, however effective it is, and they are updating it, we've talked about some of those updates being made in, in the past, um, it, depending on how they did fire those rockets, we can see the potential for the system being overwhelmed. We've begun to see that already. We had five to 6,000 rockets uh, in recent years being fired uh, in, in, on, on Israel, and there's always a couple of rockets that manage to get through and create devastation and loss of life. So 150,000 rockets. Remember, Hezbollah is significantly more capable than Hamas. Hezbollah has significantly more resources. Their um, militias and their soldiers are much better trained than Hamas. And, um, you know, one of the strategic concerns is going to be whether or not this conflict continues in Gaza and then spills over uh, in regard to uh, Hezbollah taking action in the north because then Israel's attention will be split on two fronts. Again, we've been here before. Israel's been uh, in worse situations, believe it or not, with, with uh, all of the nations uh, around, you can think even of uh, Egypt and Jordan, uh, get, getting involved in that way. We aren't quite in the same situation with um, that, that we were in, in in those cases now. However, the concern is very real that due to alliances and also ideological allegiances, things could spill over. No, absolutely. But I think Israel needs to take a uh, measure of this uh, security situation she finds herself in and uh, turn this whole war around. I mean, Israel's not going to have another golden opportunity as Israel has now, where the nation is mobilized for war. Um, what do you think could, that looks like? Could though, actually something? take out Hezbollah in the north. Yeah. Because, um, you know, the, it's only a question of time before Israel engages in another huge conflict with, with Hezbollah. And it could actually involve, arguably, nuclear action from Iran in, in the future if we don't deal with this now. Exactly. So why, why not take this opportunity now to right. destroy your enemies? But also we know as we're unpacked during this program as well and we'll show evidence of how the Iranian regime was directly involved in this mass terrorist attack by Hamas on the 7th of October. Uh, and it's important strategically that the Iranian regime pays a price for this and they're made to pay a price for this. Um, but anyway, that will happen anyway, because he who blesses Israel will be blessed, and he who curses Israel will be cursed. So there won't be a blessing on the Iranian regime anyway. But Israel needs to restore its deterrent capabilities. It needs to show that it is the main power uh, in the region, both military and politically, and it can do this by turning the whole situation around and taking out its uh, enemies in the north. But I mean, we also see, for example, that, uh, you know, things could escalate, but it's much better that Israel preempts something rather than allowing a natural uh, escalation of this conflict. Well, the tipping point um, in World War I was the, um, well, what we have now, the equivalent of France's decision to mobilize in August 1914 would be the American and uh, Iranians in entering into direct conflict. That's what we have to keep our eyes open. Will America enter into direct conflict with Iran? Washington doesn't want this, but Arab officials uh, fear the slide towards it has already begun. I think that's fair to say. Iranian proxies have already been firing at U.S. bases in both Iraq and Syria, and there have been um, missiles as well fired on um, Iranian proxy uh, bases as well. So we're seeing this kind of soft trade back and forth to some degree. Many in the U.S. State Department and the Foreign Office now fear that America could find itself involved in two interconnected major wars in the Middle East and Eastern Europe, because we cannot forget that the conflict between Russia and Ukraine is ongoing. And arguably, if America gets sucked into um, this conflict in the U.S., if it escalates in this particular way, it can also, and it will find itself needing to get more hands-on, probably, in um, uh, Eastern Europe as well, as almost certainly Russia 
will be involving itself uh, if this escalates due to their alliances with Syria. The fact that uh, Hamas delegation recently visited the Kremlin tells you very clearly which side of this Putin is on. And with the U.S. being overstretched, China being tempted to ramp up pressure um, on, on Taiwan, we could be seeing a multi-front uh, war situation. And it's a really a critical test, not just of um, is Israel's capacity and ability. You and I both know its capacity and ability isn't found in itself. It's fundamentally spiritual. God always keeps his promises and his promises endure here and now. It will be protected, but this is really a critical test also of America's power on the global scene. Absolutely. So let's uh, now break down the evidence for you that directly puts the finger on Iranian involvement in Hamas's mass terrorist attack that occurred on the 7th of October 2023. Uh, again, according to the uh, Sunday Times, an article entitled, Iran looks behind a massacre a year in the making. Fearful of a wider conflict, officials are at pains to avoid dragging in the Islamic Republic, but evidence of them training, financing, equipping, and uh, turbocharging Hamas is piling up, great quote. On the 3rd of October, four days before the worst terrorist attack on, Israel's, on Israel in its history, Iran's supreme leader, Atollah al-Khomeini, uh, posted a cryptic message on X or Twitter, uh, the Zionist regime is dying. He says that the Iranian regime has for many years been Hamas's main sponsor, uh, both share the goal of Israel's destruction. Iran has helped to arm and train Hamas terrorists, and according to Ishmael Hillel, uh, Hamas leader, the regime uh, funds its 70 million US dollars per year. Uh, no government so far has produced intelligence uh, that publicly pin the blame on Tehran. However, some analysis believe this may be driven by the West a desire to avoid a full-blown regional war. So as the IDF spokesman has said that Iran is directly assisted Hamas with money, training, weapons and know-how. And the Wall Street Journal uh, reported that Iran had helped plan and refine the attack in a series of meetings held in Beirut in August. It claimed that the fortnightly meetings uh, were attended by IRGC officials. Uh, with high-ranking figures of Hamas and Hezbollah and Hossein Amir, the uh, Iranian foreign minister, attended at least two of these meetings. It seems, uh, with evidence mounting, that the green light for this particular attack on the 7th of October was actually given a week um, prior, almost, on the 2nd of October, that's the Monday previous. Israel believes that the terror attack had been planned for well over a year. While Israel was tearing itself apart with its judicial reforms, violence within the Palestinian Authority, uh, all, all sorts of infighting politically and confusion being distracted across the board, um, this was being planned under the radar under wraps. Hamas was taking a much lower profile compared to its younger sister PIJ and what we see is um, the, the aftermath of it. The Wall Street Journal reported last week that as many as 500 terrorists from Hamas and Palestinian Islamic Jihad received specialist training under Quds Force instructors in Iran in September. One former Israeli security source told the Sunday Times that thousands of Hamas operatives had been spotted by Egypt training in Gaza. When Cairo warned its neighbor something terrible was afoot, Tel Aviv seems to have assured the terrorists uh, were on a military drill. Experts believe that the weapons used by Hamas were also from Iran. And uh, we see now, as this has developed, Hezbollah is poised to strike on Israel's northern front. It's poised to strike. It's already striking. It's already struck in many ways on uh, smaller forays uh, against the border by individual soldiers and groupings of soldiers, as well as rocket fire. But uh, we're potentially going to see a massive escalation. Houthi rebels in Yemen have also launched missiles across the Red Sea with uh, U.S. military bases in Syria and Iraq being struck as well. Uh, uh, Shamrit Mayer, uh, chief foreign policy advisor to Naftali Bennett, said Hamas is not alone. Hamas is part of a wider network. The axis of resistance is very loyal, coordinated, and resourceful. 
So let's have a look at uh, this excellent uh, CPN news report uh, saying how that the Iranian regime together with Turkey is now threatening Israel. Israel is fighting on four fronts. In Gaza, the IDF released footage of its methodical ground invasion of the Gaza Strip as it continues its air bombardment of Hamas infrastructure. On the northern border, the military continues to attack Hezbollah installations. For days, Hezbollah and the IDF have traded rockets, artillery and anti-tank missiles. In Syria, Israeli warplanes attacked a site that shot missiles toward Israel. And in the West Bank, Israel struck a terrorist squad inside the city of Jenin. In a televised news conference Saturday night, Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu told Israelis that Israel has opened a new phase in the war. The war inside the Gaza Strip will be long and difficult, and we are ready for it. This is our second war for independence. We will fight for our native land. We will fight and won't back down. It will be the victory of good over bad, of light over darkness, of life over death. Netanyahu also highlighted the role of Iran in the attacks. He said 90 percent of Hamas's military budget comes from Iran, and that without Iran, there's no Hamas or Hezbollah. Also this weekend, the prime minister met with the relatives of the hostages. Many of the families are worried the ground invasion will endanger the hostages and support a prisoner swap to free their loved ones. Netanyahu pledged to work as hard as he could to rescue those hostages, saying the government would exercise and exhaust every possibility to bring them home. The official number of hostages is now 239. It's an unbelievable number, 239 kidnapped. Among the kidnapped are citizens, foreign workers, not a small number whose identities and reaching their families is complex for us, and it takes time to build this picture. Hence, the number that I mentioned, 239. Meanwhile, the UN warns civil order is breaking down in Gaza after thousands of people broke into U.N. warehouses and took food and water. The fallout from the war is spreading to the nations. In Dagestan, Russia, an anti-Semitic mob stormed an airport where a plane from Tel Aviv landed. The crowd hunting Jews fleeing the war in Israel, eventually going onto the tarmac and surrounding the plane. Israel's ambassador to Russia is looking for safe passage for them, and the chief rabbi of Dagestan says about 400 Jewish families may need to be evacuated. The prime ministers and foreign ministry released a statement saying, the state of Israel takes seriously attempts to harm Israeli citizens and Jews everywhere. Israel expects the Russian law enforcement authorities to protect the safety of all Israeli citizens and Jews, wherever they may be. Russia's ambassador to Israel, Anatoly Viktorov, was summoned this morning to a protest call at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in Jerusalem, following the visit of the Hamas delegation to Moscow. And in Turkey, Turkish President Recep Erdogan called Hamas a liberation group and labeled Israel a war criminal for its actions inside Gaza. And uh, this week's special guest joining us on Behind the Headlines from Washington, D.C., is Dr. David Wormser, a former advisor on the Middle East to Dick Cheney in the White House. Uh, David, warm welcome to Behind the Headlines. Oh, thank you. It's always a pleasure and an honor to be with you. Uh, and David, um, can you just share with us, uh, please, um, your thoughts on what can only be described as the most horrific mass terrorist attack committed in Israel's history? back on Saturday, the 7th of October. Yes, Simon, I was actually there um, in uh, Tel Aviv, not down by where the massacres were, and it was quite a morning. It was, uh, we knew fairly quickly something awfully bad was happening because uh, you could see smoke rising from several points uh, across the south, columns of smoke rising, and we knew that there were Israeli cities burning, which right off told us something really horrible was happening. Uh, and then uh, the, the shock and you started seeing very rapid movement of people and that mobilization beginning uh, and a realization that Israel is not just facing another terrorist attack or even one of its more dangerous terrorist attacks or vicious missile uh, assaults, but it was facing something qualitatively and quantitatively different that in fact Israel was at war. So really within about two, three hours, it, 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 there was everybody understood 
that that Israel was completely at war uh, in a way that it had not been perhaps in 50 years. Do you see this conflict progressing to a global crisis? Well, on some level it is already. I mean, we have Yemen shooting missiles at Israel. Uh, we already have all the other fronts in Israel very hot and active, whether it's whether it's Gaza, whether it's the West Bank, whether it's uh, Judea, Samaria, or whether it's uh, Lebanon, Syria. Uh, it, it, this is all from Iran. So what we have here is already a regional component to a global war. This is not a Gaza-Israel war. This is not a Palestinian-Israeli war. This is an Iranian-American uh, war fought through Israel uh, in the region. And Iran is really part of a global axis, uh, which stretches from Pyongyang through Beijing all the way over to Bogota and Caracas now. And right now, this is the active front. Israel always finds itself at the leading edge of the Western world's uh, conflict with other, with other parts of the world because it's the vulnerable front edge. And it's a, a symbol of Western civilization that can be hit and touched by our enemies more easily than say can Peoria, Illinois and the United States. So what you're seeing here really is the, not the first, but one of the first volleys in a global movement of a certain sleepless, um, I, it's like uh, Tolkien described it, there's a, a sleepless malice that is stirring uh, and it's on the move and this is one of its moves. So in a sense, it already is a global conflict only the West has not yet digested that and is still seeing it as a localized Gaza conflict. Israel still sees it as a localized conflict on its borders uh, that's coming from Tehran. But it, it is it has global dimensions already. I don't believe this is this particular event is going to lead to a global war, because while I do believe Iran will strike Americans pretty hard in the Middle East, I think America still has not really digested what it means and will try to de-escalate. So I think this is really still an Israeli-Iranian conflict. Uh, and David, if we take ourselves back four years ago to the time when uh, President Trump was in office in the White House, we had a situation where the Iranian regime was, was on its knees because the sanctions were working. Um, we also saw that uh, Hezbollah were complaining that they were running out of money. Uh, we had the birth of the Abraham Accords. How much can you put the blame for this current conflict, uh, which Hamas has launched this war against Israel with the support of the Iranian regime, clearly at, uh, at uh, Joe Biden and the uh, Democrat uh, administration for its Middle Eastern foreign policy? Well, yeah, I think, I think there's a lot of blame to go there because, uh, first of all, the overall climate of American decline and the really the policies that were under the Obama administration convinced many in the world, especially those who want to do ill to the free world, uh, that, that the West is losing its will, that the West is crumbling, and that, in fact, the West is facing an internal threat from uh, radical progressive forces uh, and, and is, is on the way to destruction. So this encouraged our enemies to plan and prepare for war. The Trump administration, I think, held that at bay because it choked off Iran. It took a much tougher policy toward China. Uh, so there was a certain sense of American pushback under the Trump administration. Also, physically, it, uh, materially, it denied Iran the resources to do what it needed to do. The oil was cut off. The funds were cut off. Iran was at the edge of bankruptcy, and it certainly couldn't pay off its minions in Hamas or, or the West Bank or in Lebanon or in Yemen the way they could uh, before. So Iran was really on the ropes and Iran was on the defensive. And then comes the uh, Biden administration and it frankly doesn't enforce sanctions despite protesting that it does. Uh, the, the oil trade with Iran now is unrestricted practically. Uh, it now let the missile controls on Iran lapse, uh, didn't extend them even during this war, it didn't seem fit to uh, try to extend them. And Iran now is awash with money, money, some directly from the United States is the last deal, but also a lot of money from the uh, inapplication of sa sanctions and also a lot of money 
from frozen assets in other countries that had been released, partly in, under the encouragement of the United States. So now you have Hamas, the Houthis, uh, Hezbollah, Syria, all of them awash with money, and with money comes huge weapons preparations, the sort of money that was required to do what was done. So I'm not saying that this wasn't something that was already planned for a long time, and probably the roots of it lie three, four, five years back uh, during the previous uh, Trump administration. But I think the reality of the ability to do this and the funding that is required to do this and the strategic sense of retreat that provides the climate to do this and overall the uh, assault on the Abraham Accord countries that are at peace with Israel and Saudi Arabia, who was in advanced stages of negotiating peace with Israel, really teed up an opportunity for Iran right now to try to sabotage all that good movement that was really helping the West, helping Israel integrate into the region and helping Israel cobble together a defense structure with Arab nations that really begin to challenge Iran and anchor Western interests in the region. This is what Iran was attacking because it saw it had an opportunity and it had felt it had an opportunity Unfortunately, I think because of the policies of the Biden administration. David, why do you think that Israel and its allies are not acting in some form of, you could say retaliatory, but effectively a preemptive way to disable Iran's uh, military capabilities? Is there a concern that such action would escalate this conflict out of proportion? Uh, yeah, are you talking about possible Israeli preemption or American preemption? Either. Well, uh, start with the Israelis. I, I think the Israelis are thinking about it and their whole mentality is changing. I, I think you're going to see a much more aggressive Israeli policy coming out of this. But Israel really for many years had descended into an entirely defensive concept. It started with building the wall when they withdrew from Gaza and they withdrew from parts of the West Bank, they built a wall thinking that will keep them away. Well, that didn't work. There were tunnels that were built under the wall, so they built a defensive structure against the tunnels. Well, that uh, earlier than that, it didn't work, so they started shooting missiles at Israel from Gaza, so they built the Iron Dome. Over and over and over again, what you see is the Israelis essentially engaging in defensive maneuvers to try to prevent a threat from being unmanageable, and moreover, preventing Israel from having to re-enter those territories. So in many ways, it, it, Israeli defensive policies protected uh, the Palestinian Authority and Hamas from Israeli reinvasion. If they didn't have Iron Dome, for example, they probably would have invaded long ago because Israel couldn't take 6,000 missiles actually hitting their cities. They can take 6,000 missiles thrown at their cities that are shot down and never hit. But 6,000 hitting is an immense amount of damage, and they would have gone in on the ground in 2012, 2000. So there, there's a defensive policy that's set in, also with Hezbollah in Lebanon, build a wall, et cetera. That collapsed on October 7th. And the Israelis now understand that going on, sitting on defense may prolong the day in which you face a catastrophic uh, attack, which they have, uh, but it doesn't, it doesn't annul that day's ever coming. So I think the Israelis are fundamentally reconsidering their defensive uh, outlook and turning back to the Israel that we saw in the 50s and 60s, which is far more preemptive and far more aggressive. Uh, the United States doesn't seem yet to digest what is going on. It doesn't want this to spread as, in an absolute way. Uh, so it's trying to deter Iran and Hezbollah from escalating, and it's trying to pressure Israel not to escalate. Uh, and I still believe that the United States has not reconsidered its position under this administration regarding Iran. It clearly sees it as more of an aggressive state, but it still believes that it can come to some sort of an arrangement, uh, some sort of an understanding, especially with moderates in Iran, to try to create a regional climate of, of calm. And that's what, what has been destroyed in Israel, the, the concept of deterrence and the concept that Iran is anything but a, a, an active threat that will always destabilize. So there is, I see, light of day emerging between Israel and America. That said, I think that 
Iran will probably push it to the point that Americans on a popular level understand what Iran is. So I think in the longer term, America's headed also for a conflict with Iran. And, and David, uh, finally, uh, we know that Israel has managed to turn around very desperate situations that she's been in, starting with Israel's War of Independence in 1948 and 49. Uh, Israel turned the situation around during the Six Day War, uh, tripled her size in territory, including that of the Yom Kippur. And I read a really interesting article by uh, Israel's former ambassador to the United States, Michael Oren, who said Israel should use this opportunity now, instead of going off to Hamas in Gaza to actually remove the threat of Hezbollah in the north. Could this be um, a strategic opportunity for Israel to not only destroy Hamas, Hezbollah, but also to take out Iran's nuclear facilities? Because surely the Iranian regime has to pay a price uh, for what it did on Saturday, the 7th of October. Yeah, when they're firing missiles from Yemen into Israel, which they're, they're doing as we speak, uh, this is Iran ordering it, and Iran should not be given a free pass in having itself not being attacked when it is attacking Israel from right, from every angle through its proxies. Uh, I think, though, you hit on something very important, which is the concept of taking the war strategically to Iran. That would involve, obviously, sabotaging in whatever way Israel can, its nuclear program. But I think even more, Israel has to begin to, rat, it has to make the strategic point that it is Iran that is the spider web, that is, as, as Nasrallah of Hezbollah keeps calling Israel, a spider web, that you pull a string and the whole thing collapses on itself and has no mass. He, essentially that Israel is just fake and it will fall to pieces with the slightest breeze. Uh, Israel has to make that point about the Iranian regime. The Iranian regime is weak. Its people hate it. The Iranian people are showing signs of actually siding to some extent with Israel against their regime. So I think this war properly executed in the end, and I think Israelis are coming there and will, will arrive at this conclusion as well themselves. I see a lot of Israelis already there. Uh, powerful Israelis and influential Israelis, that this is a great opportunity not only to take down Hezbollah because Israel can't wake up the day after this war and have the same situation with Hezbollah that they had with Hamas, except Hezbollah is 10 times more powerful, and wake up a, a year from now and see another 2,000 Israelis slaughtered on their northern border. So one, they see an opportunity to take out Hezbollah and change the strategic reality in the northern border. Two, they're beginning to hit Syrian regime targets. Destabilizing the Syrian regime and hitting key units that are part of the regime, uh, that's the anchor of Iran's strategy in the, in the, Eastern, in the Western Levant, in the Western Fertile Crescent. If that is shaken, rattled, or even destroyed, Iran faces a catastrophic strategic setback. And from October 7th, where Israel was in strategic retreat regionally and Iran was appearing to be the strong horse racing forward, that will start changing the situation to Iran being not the strong horse, but the lame donkey. And Israel, instead of being the lame donkey, becomes the strong horse. The strategic direction, momentum shifts against Iran. And I think apart from direct attacks that could sabotage the Iranian nuclear program and potentially maybe some symbolic attacks against regime symbolic targets like IRGC headquarters, I think what you'll see is the Iranian people <clears throat> sensing that Iran's government has overreached and is in trouble. And that's when these totalitarian dictatorships enter their periods of greatest internal danger. So I think at the end, the real way for, for this to end in Western interest, the way the West would, should really hope this end, is Iran besieged, its government rattled, its people threatening it, if not bringing it down, and Israel, the strong horse that has Saudi Arabia, the UAE, the Abraham Accords countries, forming a powerful strategic alliance against the Iranian regime. So Iran threatened internally, Iran threatened externally, and Iran basically feeling the weight of the West bearing down on it. That's how this war ought to end. And I think this is an opportunity to do so. And Israel has within its power to do it.
Uh, Dr. David Worms, it's been an absolute pleasure for you to join us on uh, this week's Behind the Headlines. Um, I wish you actually advising the Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu right now because uh, this is exactly the strategic measures that Israel needs to take. And so thank you so much for your wonderful and superb analysis and uh, you bring some brilliant ideas to the table. So thank you. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you, Simon. Very thankful to Dr. David Wormser there for his incredibly insightful and incisive perspective on this escalating crisis in the Middle East. Uh, incredibly helpful. Um, Simon, what do you make of some of the points Dr. Wormser was uh, commenting on there? I mean, I think essentially, if we actually see how, for example, when Biden came to power, how he completely reversed every single policy that President Trump and his administration put through. Um, and he and it's exactly the same with the Middle East. So if effectively he unfroze the uh, the uh, sanctions on the Iranian regime. He wanted to engage in the Iranian regime, bring it back to the table and have a new Iran agreement. Uh, we also see that he then um, started to refund the Palestinian Authority. Uh, with huge amounts of money, um, which, 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 for example, President Trump actually froze. And he just did everything in reversal. Now we're effectively seeing all of his or US foreign policies uh, absolutely unravel. Uh, and the key to uh, President Trump's Middle East policy was to empower both the Saudis and the Israelis as the main power brokers in the Middle East. Um, and he's threatened to do that. Uh, he's undermined uh, the Saudi influence in the region. He's undermined Israel's security guarantees. Uh, and also coming out recently as well, saying that the only um, negotiation on the table is for Israel to return to a two-state solution. How can Israel return to a two-state solution after this mess, which gives the, uh, the Iranians a green light to carry out mass terrorist attacks because they fear no response from the United States. Um, we saw also with the Trump administration, they took out uh, the uh, Iranian general uh, Kazemi, um, and that sent shockwaves throughout the Iranian regime. Um, and again, there is no fear of the United States. So, uh, and the United States needs to show um, that it is the world superpower on the world stage. So I think what we're seeing as well is a situation of how through what David Worms uh, uh, really informed us of how Israel can use these dire circumstances in order to turn the Middle East around to its strategic advantage uh, and having an historic opportunity to destroy Hezbollah in southern Lebanon, but also to take the war to Iran. And that's exactly who the head of the snake is. And until we deal with this Iranian regime, we're not going to deal with any of the problems in the Middle East. If we are to prevent a regional war now or in the future, it means tackling the Iranian regime head on. Don't you view this as almost inevitably then leading into that World War III scenario? I mean, we, we have, there are six ways that the Sun newspapers, journalists have um, identified with which this conflict could lead to World War III. There's a real danger, uh, and they say six terrifying steps that could see this spiral into World War III with even Britain and U.S. troops on the ground. They're outlined briefly as Israel is seen as overreacting. The war spreads to Lebanon. Syria and Russia then team up. Iran kicks off, which I think Iran kicking off would precede a couple of those steps anyway. They're almost, I mean, have they not kicked off already to some degree? Uh, UK and US enter the fight, and then in uh, their sixth point, the Saudi is forced in. Do you not see them dealing with Hamas in the way that they're promising to, as Netanyahu said even this week, to consign them to the dustbin of history, which I'm all in favor of, do you not see that as almost inevitably leading to this World War III scenario? I, I, I actually, looking at this from a pure analytical point of view, uh, Reagan, I think if Israel does not respond, and if the United States does not respond and Britain respond to this, it's only a question of time before we have World War III anyway. Right. So it's much better now to deal with those uh, dark demonic forces in the Middle East and the malevolence of the Iranian regime now 
before they get bigger and stronger. Before Iran has full uh, nuclear capability. Yeah, because one, once Iran has nuclear weapons, it's a game changer. Yeah. No one can threaten their regime. If their regime is threatened, they will use nuclear weapons to defend themselves. And before we know it, we're involved in nuclear Armageddon, which is exactly what the Iranians want, because they want to bring about the 12th Amman or the Mahdi. So why not use these um, dangerous security situation that Israel finds itself in, turn it around as Israel did in the Yom Kippur War in nine, and also in the Six Day War in 1967, go after Hezbollah in southern Lebanon, destroy Hezbollah, destroy the Hamas Iranian threat, but also then take out uh, the Iranian regime's nuclear facilities and also bomb key military targets within Iran, will send a very, very clear message to Iran that uh, you are not immune from attack. And this is what um, any strategic thinking president in the White House would be saying, yeah, we need to do this. So I, I fully agree with you, Simon. Um, Ex-Navy Chief Admiral Lord West speaks on how this could spiral. He views it out of control into all-out war. And of course, neither of us desire that to take place. But as we've spoken of before, and even as um, Prime Minister Netanyahu has said, there is a time for war. It's there in Ecclesiastes 3. The reality is tragically that you can't often get to that time of peace apart from a time of war. Uh, and just as the psalmist reminds in Psalm 120, when um, I am for peace, I speak, I am for peace, but they're always for war. This is what Hamas has desired. They have been the ones who've started. This is what Hezbollah wants. This is ultimately, as you said, goes right back to the heart of the matter to Iran. But, uh, Lord West has spoken of the potential of with Israel being viewed as overreacting with a high civilian um, death, death toll in the Gaza Strip. There's already a sense which across Europe and the United States we are seeing Jews being targeted simply because they are Jewish um, because of the civilian casualties that are being reported. I say, I emphasize that are being reported um, in the Gaza Strip because um, the numbers that are being bandied about are Hamas numbers. And they're known uh, to practice not only because of the ideological um, uh, deception that Islam often revels in, but uh, that they're known because of their own end goals to amplify their figures and numbers. Well, we've had weeks of uh, being told that there's no fuel, and every single time we're told hours away from no fuel, suddenly there's fuel. We found fuel again. Where, where did you find the fuel? What was it? Oh, it was always there. Um, th there's this attitude that Israel is in some way responsible for um, both responding in uh, a pr proportionate way is the terminology that's spoken of, which uh, in war is a myth anyway, but um, it, it, they are responsible for providing aid. Aid is getting in. Hamas isn't allowing it to be distributed. They're telling civilians, move south to Khan Yunus. They're, they're not... They're not, uh, Hamas is not allowing that. So Israel is being painted as this overreacting bogeyman that is, is driving the world into war. But this is where Hamas and Iran desire it. War is spreading to Lebanon. Hezbollah is already responding to some degree. Um, do, do you see them escalating that being likely? I, it, it depends on Israel's response, doesn't it? I mean, if, uh, for example, the Iranian regime feels that Israel will get to a stage where Hamas is completely and utterly wiped out, then they could then get involved. But if Israel carries out a very strategic uh, um, a strike against Hezbollah in the north, um, then this is too... Um, arms of the Iranian regime will be completely cut off um, and it then limited its ability to attack Israel. I mean, what uh, Admiral uh, Lord West is predicting, he said that the UK and the US could see boots on the ground in Lebanon and Syria and Iran and Russia might be drawn into the fight. He said it's a very dangerous, heady mix. Uh, this uh, might turn into a fight. He says in uh, an inflammable mix of uh, promises of revenge, military alliances, violent protests and high civilian casualties, this could be a powder keg about to be lit. Um, 
He does say this one, for example, that uh, uh, predicting what could take place in the next few days, weeks or months, the former Navy chief predicts that it could kick off with a heavy handed high civilian casualty approach by Israel. Well, firstly, Israel has so far proved, as she has time and time again, that Israel does not target innocent civilians, only terrorist targets, and Israel is extremely careful about civilians. And this is why Israel's given weeks uh, for the uh, uh, civilians of Gaza to flee to the south for their own safety. But he says here that Israel quite understandably wants revenge. Israel, uh, you know Israel Reagan, uh, you know Jewish people, R revenge is not on their mind. What they want is to eradicate Hamas so Hamas can never carry out the attack as it carried out on October the 7th. It's not revenge is to ensure that Israel never has to go through that again. Yeah, absolutely. It's not about revenge at all. And yet this is um, how it's going to be viewed. It's how it's going to be painted and already how it is being painted. Um, Lebanon potentially getting involved, trying to um, protect. Um, Lebanon has been in a mess economically. It's been in a mess politically for some time now. Uh, that's its own doing, it's its own responsibility for that. And so Lebanon in one way is going to be wary of escalating this to uh, where they will come under a severe attack. Lord West does comment there in uh, the, the Sun in regard to that in an insightful way. Um, but Brits have already been ordered by the Foreign Office to immediately get out of Lebanon as violent pro-Palestine protest broke out. The U.S. Embassy in Beirut being targeted and U.K. ministers fearing that the Israel-Hamas war could spill into the fragile nation at any moment. The, with the possibility of Lebanon in shambles, the next step then would be for Russian-backed Syria to join in, as uh, Lord West has suggested that Bashar al-Assad would be very stupid, but he might feel that he should somehow be involved. The problems there being that Assad is supported by Russia. Uh, explaining then that that would be a means for Putin to be pulled into the dogfight. He's already very clearly shown where his allegiances would lie there. Uh, the West noted how the Israel-Hamas war is already fantastic for Putin because it's taken people's eyes off the Ukraine conflict where uh, th there continues to be a great death toll, there continues to be a great need. The more he can stoke this up, the happier he will be, and the happier his pariah pal Iran will be, according to Lord West. Uh, the, with a nation hell-bent on destruction, Iran, Lord West says, could try to use her ability to inspire terrorism in other countries to provoke attacks on Israel. Indeed, Iran is calling for around the world for Muslims to mount attacks and to um, commit acts of terror and jihad. So this is already to some degree taking place. That would make Israel feel that there should be some re reaction against Iran. And this uh, retired admiral has said that it uh, became really bad. If things became really bad and Israel attacked Iran, then there's no doubt Iran would accuse the U.S. and U.K. of being involved. So as so we were talking about with um, Dr. Vermzer earlier, any strike against Iran is going to definitely escalate things. But personally, Simon, now may be about the time. No, I, I, I think so. And, and, and uh, this is a question of Israel's survival in the Middle East. Um, Israel restoring its deterrent capabilities, which was destroyed on the 7th of October. And Israel has to come out of this conflict stronger than when she went in it before. So no doubt there'll be a, a radical rethinking of the IDF uh, and how the IDF views the threat from Hezbollah, from Hamas, from the Iranian regime. But we've presented in this program clear evidence, thanks to the Sunday Times, of Iran's direct involvement in the worst massacre in Israel's history uh, since the Holocaust over 80 years ago uh, on the 7th of October. And uh, you know, this is important that if we are to prevent anything from happening like this again, then, the Ura then Israel needs to take affirmative action against the Iranian regime. So the Iranian regime pay a price because at the moment, the Iranian regime and the Alatollahs and the Mullahs are conducting this war from Tehran. Mm in the safety of their own homes. But they know that if they become uh, uh, threatened and their regime is threatened, then they pay a price for their inaction in supporting Hezbollah and Hamas. They are literally 
bankrupting the, uh, the country in order to support Hamas and Hezbollah and prop up Assad's regime. The UK and US have already entered. They've given warnings to the Iranian regime to not get involved in any further way than they already have been. Um, and we, we do see that um, and we've seen shots fired actually already as last Friday a US Navy warship fired what are believed to be America's first shots in defense of Israel. The warship operating in the Red Sea downed drones and missiles launched by Iran-backed Houthi rebels in Yemen believed to be targeting um, Israel. Uh, if Israel begins to fall apart in any way due to Hezbollah and Hamas, then there is a very realistic danger of the U.S. and the U.K. getting involved. Uh, but the last step to all of this could even see Saudi, um, who is constantly against Yemen's Houthi rebels, being drug into this uh, to some degree, and certainly the recent um, Abraham Accords and the development while tensions have at times been high as a result of this, it could escalate further and uh, the volatile and gun-toting Houthis have been provoking Saudi by shooting Iranian-supplied missiles even into their territory. Absolutely. So uh, we know that uh, the Middle East is, is hotening up and of course the Bible refers to uh, the coming of Jacob's troubles uh, for Israel and uh, as we see that this is happening more and more. But, but the one thing we're seeing that in any conflict in the Middle East, we're seeing an escalation in Jew hatred, not only in our country, but across the world as well. And uh, so therefore it's imperative that we, uh, we pray for our Jewish communities, that we, we stand with Israel, uh, and that Israel has the moral right to defend ourselves against genocidal terrorist organizations like Hezbollah, Hamas, and also the Iranian regime needs to be in Israel's target site. So thank you for watching this week's edition of Behind the Headlines.